So we'll um, go over a little bit more in detail um, on the open label experience, but the presentation now is gonna emphasize um, the use of the, of the titers. Obviously, we understand that they are an indirect indication of the presence of the virus. By no means is detecting the actual virus. However, the uh, idea that the high titers could reflect an ongoing viral replication came from the work that we had been doing with uh, toxoplasmosis and other intracellular pathogen for years, where in that model is very clear we have follow-ups of 10, 20, 40 years, patients in whom we have obtained the serum for that long, and it's clear that the titers, after the acute phase of the infection, if there is no reactivation, they remain low for decades. Um, there is also another group uh, in Oregon that has worked with EBV, uh, incidentally, that, that's not their primary uh, goal of their work, where they have shown that patients who are not patients, individuals who are otherwise healthy for 26 years, that EBB titers remain steady as a rock. So for us, it was interesting to see that there were patients who had the chronic fatigue syndrome who had the high titers to both the EBV and to um, HSV-6. Uh, and also, in the process of identifying these patients, we have found other patterns of patients with, with different profiles, with different antibodies, that we are now in the early stages of working with them and proposing some interventions focused on, 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 on those, um, uh, but the numbers are too small to, to present them here. Again, just wanna be sure that it is understood that this is the work of a team, this is by no means an individual, and we had had support from the, um, the hospital, from the university, um, and then from the HSV6 Foundation, uh, from Roche, uh, though we remain independent from Roche, we don't have any conflict of financial conflict of interest with Roche, and this is the, the, the team that does the actual work, uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Kogelnik, uh, Mervina de Guzman, the uh, nurse coordinator, and this, uh, uh, these are two pre-medical students. This is a medical students who are outstanding people who they are, they are terrific. And these, uh, San, Sandy, Jane, the nurses, Debbie, regulatory affairs. This is the laboratory group head by Mark Winters. Um, and Lee is the statisticians and Taylor is a terrific also pre-med student. So this is the experience that early that we reported with the use of valgancyclovir. Um, in patients who have these elevated titers, and that was the key for us, was the uh, elevation of both uh, HSV6 and EBV. Please remember that when we say EBV, we do not mean all the three. We mean VCA, EA, not EBNA. We very early on rule out EBNA. We do not take that into account at all. And then the HSV6 titer as well. And what we have noticed that I alluded yesterday is that those patients on Valside, there was this dramatic uh, improvement pre preceded in most patients by a also dramatic worsening in their cognitive and physical functions and they will eventually get back to near normal and many of them to lead normal lives. So we were impressed by this and that's how the whole thing started back in 2004. Um, and it, we are very pleased to know, and I want you to know that, that Stanford has opened the clinics again and has opened the research facilities to our work with uh, CFS since 2004. And making uh, justice to their motto, the Stanford's motto is where the winds of freedom blow. So we have been given freedom to work on this despite that there were letters that came from our division to patients in the community and to providers that we were not supposed to see in fact, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients at Stanford. So we were able to change uh, that. Uh, so I'll focus on the open label experience with the subset of patients who have elevated titers, but I will also emphasize the low titers uh, outcome. And then some of the early experience with other infectious etiologies as well. So we're gonna look at the role of elevated titers if they can predict the response to valgancyclovir treatment uh, and to try to determine the response rates in those who have elevated versus those who do not have the elevated titers and compare the response rates between them. It was a retrospective review, unlike the double-blind prospective randomized trial, 
We had 56 patients between February 2004, which is when we started to do this, and December 2007 at Stanford. We divided them in responders. These patients clearly had improved physical and cognitive. There was a group of patients that clearly stated that they had much better cognitive function, but their fatigue had not improved yet or had not improved at the time that we did the analysis. And there were some patients who did not respond, meaning no physical or cognitive activity. And I want to call your attention to this group of patients. It's called undetermined. They are a small group, fortunately. Luckily, they're a small group. But it's very sad when you sit down in front of a patient and, and, and you cannot know truly whether they have or not improved. But that happens. That happens. So the need for objective measures of their cognitive function, physical ability, biomarkers, gene expressions that can really shed light whether a or an intervention is working or not is, is in desperate need because this is very sad after you and the patient have gone through the whole thing not knowing uh, if they have responded or not. Patients were also divided in two groups. The cutoff for high titers versus low titers is just one dilution uh, different than the randomized trial. Here the VCA, IgG, is uh, 320 or, or greater in the study is 640. The EA is 80 or greater in the study is 160. The G is 320. Or we uh, increase this, uh, make it a little bit stricter if the HSV6 titers was low. But the key thing is that we pay attention primarily to EA, VCA, and HSV6 at the same time. So that's the other difference. It's not either one, but the three has to meet, the three criteria have to be met. And the proportion of patients who uh, responded to elevated titers was compared to those who responded with the low titers. 24 of the 56 patients were classified as responders. Three patients had cognitive clear-cut respond, but we didn't classify that as responders. We just put them as cognitive responders. So to be called responder, you had to have a significant change in your physical and cognitive of greater than 30% from your baseline. 18 patients were classified as non-responders, no cognitive, no physical, and then 11 patients uh, classified as not determined, not possible to determine. The median increase in self-rated physical activity for responders, and that includes also the cognitive component, was 63% uh, a change, so it was a significant change from baseline, and by definition, in non-responders were 0%. 18 of the 23 patients who said that they clearly had responded, these are dramatic responses in their physical, and this is at night and day differences. 78% uh, of them had elevated titers by those criteria, whereas in the group of non-responders, no physical, no cognitive, only 27% of them had the criteria of elevated titers. So we found that there was a higher proportion in responder patients who had the high titers and, 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 the, and much lower in the non-responders. And I showed you briefly that yet this yesterday, but those patients who clearly tell us that their lives had been changed, really this is patients who had dramatic response they tend to have higher proportion of patients with high titers versus those who do not respond. They tend to have uh, the lower titers. So patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and elevated baselines, uh, titers against HSV6 and BBB appear to be more likely to respond to valgancyclovir intervention uh, in this patient population. 